Okay, thank you for the call lab 2020 for uh, giving me this chance. It's an honor to present on this virtual conference on liberties in Africa. So my topic will be on hepatitis B virus test and treat strategy. So I have nothing to disclose. So my aim in this uh, presentation will be, I'll try to discuss the burden of hepatitis B virus infection and the challenges to implement to the uh, WHO guideline and to reach the ambitious goal of uh, elimination of hepatitis B in 2013. And I try to discuss the characteristics of patients which I have seen with HCC in our cohorts. And I'll present the cascade of care and the recommendations for, for testing and treatment strategy. So we know this hepatitis uh, B virus and hepatitis B C virus with the current mode of treatment and care it will be the number one cause of uh, infectious disease surpassing tuberculosis, HIV, and malaria, even more uh, if, 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 you are, if you are not doing much effort to control these infections. So even in Ethiopia, where I'm located with a population of around 109.2 million people are in as this in this slide, it's the uh, most populous country second to Nigeria and with the estimated prevalence of hepatitis B, from a recent meta-analysis was 7.4%. From another study uh, which, in which each country has been presented, as I've been shown, it's around 9.4%. And I, I put some red spots with the countries or cities with the highest prevalence of infection. I just put same so that we can identify the most common risk factors that are important also for the prevention of uh, hepatitis B virus infection. And the from the global estimate, the task force for hepatitis elimination, they said that around 6,348 people has a model to, like days of hepatitis B virus in 2019. That means around one days occurs every hour actually. So when combined to other African countries and other low and middle income countries, this number is really, is really high still. And this ambitious goal to treat hepatitis B uh, eliminate viral threat as a public health threat. It has also a guideline, as you know, and uh, the plan is, so we are in 2020 and we are 10 years uh, to the 2030 elimination plan. And this is a time to see how the program, the progress of the testing treatment of hepatitis B virus infection up to now and what will happen to the next 10 years. Actually, with this COVID pandemic, the WHO actually has planned, actually probably will change the, this elimination target, this ambitious target, but we'll see what has been done from here and can we really achieve that with, uh, with this guideline. So the most important problems that I want to discuss is from this guideline are the problems like in the staging and non-invasive tests in which non non-invasive tests are preferred to assess for the presence of cirrhosis. And then the APRI score or viral DNA, which has been used as a treatment criteria. And also we can see that still viral DNA very important. And also we can see for the monitoring also viral DNA, E antigen and APRI has been recommended as a treatment. So I'll try to uh, mention this WHO guideline and to question how it fails, I mean, in, in low and middle income countries, how we fail to uh, manage or the problems with these uh, different uh, recommendations. So if, if you just start, when you have patients with hepatitis B virus, the problem starts from the screening, which individuals, or who are individuals likely to be screened? So we know we can use a diagnosis of diagnostic from antenatal care visits, a blood bank, immigration, patients with symptoms, chronic liver disease patients could be important. But as I've said, from those rate spots, for example, in the country, we can see what are the common practices that those cities are using. So we have seen that, for example, female genital mutilation and also hospital births, low hospital births or like births in the home base are important risk factors that we find for those infections. And also doing a meta-analysis are also important to know which individuals are here to be screened so that we can find the missing millions. So from this meta-analysis, these are the most important risk factors, for example, for the infection in Ethiopia, like who, who has history of abortion, HIV co-infection, multiple sexual partners, history of piercing, sharp material. So traditional scarifications, which are common practice for 
treatment and previous vascular transmission. So this could be important. So countries should uh, should study actually the risk factors for head infection too, so that they can reach to a higher level which individuals to be screened. And then comes the diagnosis and then the liver fibrosis assessment. If it was easy, then you would have a treatment and one big problem that you also see for all these in low and middle income countries, patients are paying out of pocket payments and this will be difficult with the, with the high viral load uh, diagnostic test and also the treatment is actually now decreasing if you are uh, mobilizing the generic uh, drugs to be available. So in the staging and NITs, we have seen these studies and from other studies, the recommended tests like APRI, FIV4, and also the GPR were not sensitive. And it had been seen that like the, the APRI in this study has a lower sensitivity of around 10%. The same occurs like in the West Africa and also other studies like, uh, which is around 25% or uh, around 20 So it misses, so if we rely only on APRI, it misses many patients that are in need of treatment. And um, so we need to have other tests like the, probably the uh, other tests that depends on E antigen and ALT might be an important uh, non-invasive test, probably better than this test to diagnose uh, fibrosis. And we have shown that the WHO guidelines has failed to detect many patients. The main thing is looking at the character, baseline characteristics of our patients, like 90% uh, were having E antigen negative and we can see that genotype A was present in around 85%, and the co-infection rate was, uh, hep delta was around 1.4% from this cohort, and also for hep C, it was around 2.7%. You can see the different parameters. Patients are having even uh, lower ALT, as you see, 81.3%, and uh, APRI was present, like, more, more than two was in only, like, 2.6% of these individuals. So if you use APRI alone, uh, we can we miss 50% of patients. That means patients with significant fibrosis that's detected on transient elastography or 48% of patients with cirrhosis has been missed if we rely on only and the APRI criteria of uh, at least two. So, uh, so and then we see HCC patients from the cohort of studies. So this is a cohort of like uh, this, for example, a three years cohort. And I have, uh, well, so we have found around 17 patients from this course to study. And one patient is only alive after the three years. This patient is having a small size of the liver tumor. I want to characterize what kind of patients we have in this patient with hepatocellular cancer. So these seven patients were diagnosed and the smallest age, youngest age was 26 years of age and with a median of 48 years of age. This is actually lower than the other affluent countries. Cases were diagnosed within 12 months of treatment, as you see, and the median ALT was 42%. And, um, uh, and viral load, if you rely on viral load of more than 20,000, 41.2% were having a viral load of less than 20,000, and 70% were having a viral load of greater than 2,000. And you can see that uh, many of the patients were having either a higher uh, size of the liver tumor or multiple liver tumors, which are not peaked with ultrasound and alpha beta protein, because we have seen that these values were less sensitive to peak such kind of tumors. So these individuals were found through follow-up, through one year of follow-up, and ultrasound and FU is not also sensitive in these patients. And we have seen 76.5% per percent with having either a large or a multiple tumors. And treatment options are also limited once the diagnosis and an affordable once a patient has HCC. And one patient with compliance, uh, failure of compliance or non-compliance develop HCC on the follow-up period of time. So we, we can see that the median ALT is low. We can see a patient can develop hepatocellular carcinoma even at a lower viral load level, younger age and uh, viral load. And we can see that most of the patients were having E antigen negative. So the guidelines actually cannot pick these individuals and we need to have uh, a different, I mean, a better guidelines that pick this patient at early age before they develop hepatocellular cancer. So this is a, a prospective court study just to show 
And this is that we try to also decentralize. Decentralization to care can be pos is possible in patients with hepatitis B. Like patients, once you characterize them, if you really diagnose inactive carriers, then it can be decentralized to the like a study nurse or health officers can be do the follow up. And patients who need treatment, once the physicians has reached a treatment decisions, then the follow up can be also decentralized, and we can put like the red flags paint to consult. Uh, otherwise, the refill, the follow-up can also be done. So such kind of um, decentralization are very important to, to reach the elimination targets. And this was what we are using because the non-invasive tests were not strong enough. We have used uh, fibrous CAN values actually to, uh, to use to diagnose compensated cirrhosis so a significant stiffness from the fibrous CAN value. And uh, we also added uh, first degree related family history of uh, hepatocellular cancer. As we see, many of individuals are having cancer. The African patients are also having a poor prognosis. So we added family history of cancer as an important uh, uh, criteria for treatment. And um, as an important thing that I want to discuss is the predictors of virological failure. It was diagnosed as 69 actually after one year of treatment. This is just to strengthen the importance of adherence. So we used the previous uh, pharmacy refill data that had been used for the HIV. So based on that pharmacy refill uh, pill count, we have assessed that if the adherence is less than 95%, there is significant you know, statistical significant difference in biological failure, but we have assessed that this patient, there is no drug resistance and patients could have actually depend on may have high viral load after the, even after a year, but the, it doesn't mean the fail of treatment or resistance. We have checked that there is no resistance, but we need to strengthen on that. And the other predictor was the initial viral load level, which is very high, or than 10 raised to 6, was also significant. One thing that I want to show is also patients with uh, predictors of mortality has been published, uh, and we have seen that uh, we have added BMI. BMI, it, you know, it doesn't come just by chance. Uh, we have seen that BMI has been the initial predictor of uh, like child, it has been used in the child food state from the initial times. And when you see our ind individuals with low BMI, when we see that they are having associated poor prognosis, which is stat statistically significant, we want to use that. So age, low BMI, and also decompensative cirrhosis were the most important predictors of mortality which was significant because the BMI with adjusted hazard ratio of 3.65. This has been main implications because patients with viral hepatitis are denied of protein diet when they come. And these patients, even with the viral hepatitis diagnosis that's uh, by the physicians or by their, uh, due to uh, like different uh, advice that are being given to these patients, they are devoid of protein diet when they come, it's they have, having low BMI. So it shows that this is also one predictor of mortality. So it can, it helps us to uh, reach main individuals to train to educate them that patients should maintain a good BMI when they, with their diagnosis. And once a patient having low BMI or decompensation and increasing age, they can, we need to give them a due emphasis so that we can improve their outcome by aggressive management when we find these patients. So it's clearly shows in this Kaplan mere term, you can see survival with the different BMI values. And this graph is showing the compensated and decompensated. It looks obvious that patients with decompensated could fail, have a poor prognosis. But one thing that I want to stress is patients with decompensated cirrhosis, if we uh, are aggressive in the management like we have done for patients managing their ascites, their bleeding, their nutrition. So those who survived the first six months, even with the compensative cirrhosis, like more than two thirds, those who survive after this two thirds still are alive and having a good follow-up. So we need to strengthen, we need to strengthen our care within the first six months. Still patients with decompensative cirrhosis can have a poor prognosis if they survive the initial times. So the other option in the treatment is a test and treat strategy. Uh, so the prolifica have shown that if there is high coverage of community-based screening and a good linkage to care, only proportionally required treatment. So with this, I will try to show the cascade of care. So in, as a holistic approach, the birth dose is a very important 
as a prevention schedule. Then as I've said, we need to know who the individuals who needs to be screened and to find the missing millions from a different aspect, as I have shown the risk factor assessment or selective adult vaccination from uh, meta-analysis studies or if possible, doing like a large survey might, might be important in finding the right spots. And how, so from rural areas, it may be difficult. So I will try to show that TBS usage for uh, diagnosing and then also the incentive for viral load assessment from remote areas. And then the most important thing is linkage to care. So these are studies showing that TBS as a reliable method of measurement of hepatitis B viral load in the resource limiting setting. So it can be a feasible and a really a reliable alternative. And then we need to have a linkage to care. One problem as I've said is a viral load in the fibro scan could be still a problem. I will have only two slides on the need of expansion of the treatment criteria, immune to run patients. I found this from Henry E. Chang. We can see that patients in the immune to run phase with the current knowledge, there is a highly likely chance of hepatitis B viral DNA integration and hepatitis B viral specific T cell immune response and clonal hepatocyte expansion and patients even in immune to run if there are risk factors like older age and signs of liver fibrosis, they need to treatment. They need to be treated. So otherwise there is no evidence that support treatment in other immune tolerance or if there is confirmed in active care. So the treatment guidelines should be modified by having more data from different countries. And uh, this is my final slide. So what do I recommend in general is the current indications for treatment. I mean, it's it needs to be modified and uh, collaborative studies should be done so that we can, we need to modify including the WHO guideline and relying on the blood-based non-invasive tests means main patient need of treatment. So patient can with hepatitis B virus. If you are relying on APRI or other non-invasive tests, which are still not, uh, not good enough because patient with hepatitis B will come with cancer. So we are missing many patients that need treatment. So. Uh, this is very important. The on blood based tests is a main patient test. And the other thing is lack of viral load and ANTP test hampers the treatment decision. So point of care tests of the viral load and A antigen. Now we are, we are trying to study HEP antigen with ALT as a point of care test to, to diagnose cirrhosis. So such kind of collaborative studies might be important. And from our side, we have seen that HBMI assitis, BMI didn't come by chance, BMI has been used as important uh, predictor from the initial child book stage. Child book stage currently use INR and bilirubin, which most of the rural areas do not have. So we need to have uh, guidelines based on our local capacity. And if we want to increase treatment coverage to 80%, a simplified screening and treatment strategies are important. With this, I would like to thank the COLA for, for giving me this chance to present. And thank you, thank you very much.